clearly we could spend all day on, on these topics and um, there's a lot of work that we have to do. A lot of work that we have to do. Um, in answer to the question of the grants, the, the ACA did provide community transformation grants that can be used uh, to prepare communities for the Affordable Care Act. There were the innovation grants. I'm not sure if there's another round of those. Also support in the legislation for institutions that train underrepresented minorities. There, there's a lot of uh, in the Affordable Care Act that I think we haven't taken advantage of and so we really need to um, continue this discussion and make sure that our providers know what's in the law, understand how they can take advantage of it and, uh, and utilize it. Um, and I think the regional meetings that um, I know the National Medical Association has and probably the National Dental Association has would be good times to bring in the folks from CMS or any other agency in the uh, Department of Health and Human Services to make sure that our providers get the information they need so that they can fully participate in, in the Affordable Care Act and make sure that their patients benefit from all of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. The next panel though, um, let me bring up the next panel. And this panel will be moderated by the gentleman who was helping us with the mic just a few minutes ago, uh, attorney Thomas Brunet. He's a graduate of, what is it, American? Or George? Of American, um, the law school at American University. But he's also a current uh, Lou Stokes Health Policy Fellow with the, Na with the Con Congressional uh, Black Caucus Foundation. Thomas? Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Congresswoman Christensen. Um, I'd just like to introduce our next panel. It's um, post-ACA reimbursement, payment and funding policies, the health dispari disparity impact. And I'd like to call our panelists to the stage right now. Um, during this session, panelists will highlight the impact that post-ACA reimbursement and payment policies, as well as grants, grant awards, have had on efforts to reduce health disparities and achieve health equity. And much like our last panel, the, the presentations will be followed by a question and answer session. Uh, our first panelist is Dr. Mahesh Krishnan. He's uh, the Vice President, Research and Publishing at Davida. Uh, Dr. Krishnan will talk about bundling and the impact of bundling on larger efforts to reduce racial and ethnic health disparities in chronic conditions. And our second panelist is Dr. Tad Lazarus. He's the Chief Medical Officer and head medical affairs, reimbursement, and public policy at Kaijen. Um, African American men and women have the highest incidence and death rates for both colorectal and lung cancers. Access to new targeted and personalized therapies is dependent on screening patients for the presence or absence of mutations in their tumors. Proper reimbursement for these tests is essential to lessen the disproportionate burden that these cancers have in the African American community. And um, at this moment, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Krishnan for his presentation. Well, thank you. My name is Dr. Mahesh Krishnan. Um, I am a nephrologist. I am the Vice President of, Kin of uh, Clinical Research for Davida Healthcare Partners. Um, I've been asked to speak today, I think, because I'm probably uh, well suited to lead you on a little tour. Um, that I listened intently to the last panel and a lot was being discussed around the potential for ACOs. And ACOs are something that everyone has heard about. They're kind of like the boogeyman. Everyone's heard about them. We hear they're coming to a, a, a place near you, but at this point, not a lot of people have experienced them. My specialty, which is kidney diseases, actually has had the uh, fortune of being the first disease state that a lot of these sort of payment changes are experimented upon. And what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about um, the disparities that actually exist within renal disease and kidney disease, and they are myriad. Secondly, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the bundle um, in end-stage renal disease, some stuff you probably have heard, some stuff you haven't heard, um, and hopefully educate that. And then I'm going to conclude my tour by telling you that there probably are still some disparities, um, racial disparities, in terms of the care of patients with renal disease, and that those actually are being addressed as we speak, not comprehensively, but at least we're on our way. So as, as the slides are coming up, just my first few slides just talk a little bit about renal disease in general. And so. Kidney disease is the function of, being, of having either high blood pressure or diabetes. And as you probably know, in the United States, 
the number of patients that actually have either one of those two conditions, high blood pressure or diabetes, is fairly high and continues to rise. Um, ironically, because of the very fact that we're able to treat patients with, um, for high blood pressure, for diabetes, we're able to actually understand how to keep these patients un healthy and alive longer. But one of the side effects of that is that you're either high blood pressure um, related renal disease, diabetic related renal disease, or strokes and heart, heart attacks. It's a big problem. This is a graph from a registry that's published every year. Um, this tells you the number of patients that either have diabetes, which is about 27%, or uh, congestive heart failure, which is a related complication of 13.2%. You see here that that results in about 1.3% of all Medicare beneficiaries actually having uh, end-stage renal disease, usually which requires either dialysis or a kidney transplant, um, and about 12% of patients having some semblance of renal disease, which is not something to cheer about, but that's, that's being said anyhow. <laughs> Um, but the costs are huge, right? When we think about overall costs, the costs of end-stage renal disease are high, 7.5% for that small 1.3%, 43.1% 43.1% uh, of Medicare costs related in, in 2010 for the 27% of patients that are diabetic, and you can see the numbers. It's a big, big problem. Why do I think it's actually a racial issue as well? When if you look at the demographics of who makes up patients with renal disease, and this is just having any, any part of kidney dysfunction, what you see is that African American patients, Native Americans, Asians, Hispanics, make up a disproportionate share of this. We're not really sure why this is the case. Uh, it may be that patients in these conditions either don't have adequate access to hypertension control or, or diabetic control ahead of time. And as you've heard, hypertension in the media, hypertension is a silent disease. It's silent disease as it relates to the heart, but it's also silent disease as it relates to the kidney. And so that may be one condition. Additionally, we find that patients um, have a racial predisposition towards developing renal disease. So if you have patients that have um, hypertension, they're more likely to have accelerated renal disease, and that's a problem. If you look at this, we also find that the patients who have uh, end-stage renal disease or on dialysis um, who are African-American actually end up on dialysis younger. And this, again, may speak to an access to care issue or an underlying genetic predisposition towards the disease. And a lot of research is currently being done. The same is true for those patients um, who have uh, other, other ethnic differences. They also tend to be on dialysis sooner, which to me actually does speak to a potential um, uh, reaction to not being able to access adequate health care. When I used to be in practice here across the river in Arlington, I used to tell my patients that, that kidneys are kind of like aluminum foil. Um, you can take aluminum foil out of the box, it's pristine, you crumple it up once, no matter how you try to smooth it out, it's never going to look like it came out of, that, out of that box. Kidney disease is exactly the same way. Once you have a little bit of kidney disease, there's a lot I can do as a nephrologist to help pre prevent it from getting worse, but once it gets worse, it's kind of a done deal. And so it's really, really important that you have access to care, that the blood pressure is well controlled, that if you have renal disease, it's detected, and all of that is not necessarily done from a racial predisposition. What we've actually done um, at DaVita is, is focused a little bit more on um, the things that are important to Medicare beneficiaries and the patients that we serve. DaVita is the second largest provider of renal dialysis services in the world. We have approximately 150,000 end-stage renal disease patients in the United States. We have approximately 900,000 primary care patients that we take care of. And we started off in this pyramid and we said to ourselves, you know, we as a medical community have been really focused on the bottom of this pyramid. Your labs are great. Well, that doesn't really help the patient, right? The patient cares about whether they're in the hospital or not. They care about whether or not they're losing limbs. They care about their quality of life. And so we've actually been uh, a little bit of a heretic in that we've been moving up the pyramid, as we say. We've been trying to move away from simple things that we can measure, like biochemical lab values, and moving up into more immediate things. And so if you think about that, I want to put that into context for you as it relates to payment changes and the topic of my discussion. So today we're talking a little bit about the end-stage renal disease bundle. So what is the end-stage renal disease bundle? As was mentioned before, um, both between uh, ACA and MIPA, the uh, end-stage renal disease uh, bundle was authorized. Essentially what it means is that initially, at least in dialysis, we were paid by buffet pricing, sort of piecemeal. There was a payment for the treatment of the dialysis, there was a payment for drugs, there was a payment for labs. And essentially what people said is, okay, no more a la carte dining. Let's think about whether we can align incentives. Let's see whether or not if we put everything in one all-you-can-eat buffet pricing, how does that actually affect the system? And people were scared. People thought that people would be undertreated. People thought there'd be massive amounts of complications. But I'm going to tell you today and show you some data where that is not the case. 
So the question is exactly what happened. Most of what people hear when they think about the, the dialysis bundle has to do with a specific drug called an ESA. Um, it's a drug that helps treat anemia. And so people say, well, anemia treatment went down, and that must have been because the payment system changed and people were being treated not to quality standards. Well, what I'll tell you is that there were a number of different circumstances which led to that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I don't think that's an important part of the story. But changes at CMS, changes with the FDA label, changes with the international guidelines, all of those caused doctors to be more cautious in terms of how they use their drug. And unfortunately, that coincided at the same time when there was a payment change. So I want you to sweep that aside for a second. It's probably what you read in the New York Times and read in the headlines. But I want to tell you about the individual outcomes, right? And I'm going to flip through these slides pretty quickly. Back in the fundamentals, the bottom of my periods, in the, my, my pyramid, the lab values all got better. Nothing got worse. Any lab value that you were used to measure the adequacy of dialysis, all of those got better over time. But who cares? Hospitalization rates got better. Providers were able to manage care in a more integrated fashion because they were bundled, and so hospitalization rates got better over time. Most importantly, this occurred, not, this occurred in terms of mortality. So on, the, on your left, you see, sorry, on your, on your right, you see a graph from the US Renal Data Service, which is the Medicare data. That what you see there, ladies and gentlemen, is a reduction in all-cause mortality over time. So things got better. What you see on the bottom there is our data, which is our gross mortality rate for DeVita across 150,000 patients. And huh, mortality continued to get better. So despite a massive payment change, overall, hospitalizations improved, plain old little lab values improved and mortality improved. And to me, that actually demonstrates proof of concept, that if you were to bundle payments and you were to allow providers to move out of their silos between this is money for drugs and this is money for treatment, the providers will actually do the right thing and actually improve the overall quality of care. The demonstration project is always dialysis, and I'm happy to report to you, at least from our data and from where I sit uh, at DeVita, that overall mortality, hospitalization, and lab values have improved. And for me, that actually suggests a success of the system. So what about racial disparities? I still think racial disparities exist. I think they exist outside of the confines of the pyramid. The lab values are all the same. Mortality and hospitalization is getting to be the same. But I think if you move higher up in the pyramid, if you move away from the things that we can easily measure, like lab values, and you go higher and higher up, you ask yourselves, are there still racial disparities? And I'm here to tell you, I think the answer is yes. There are racial disparities in three specific areas I'm going to highlight for you today. First, referral to dialysis. I mentioned this earlier. If you go to see a kidney doctor early enough and your kidney disease is detected, the aluminum foil gets less crumpled. You're less likely to progress to end-stage renal disease. I think there's a problem. I'll show you that in a second. Two, dialysis is good. Transplant is better. It's better to actually not have to go to the dialysis unit. It's actually better to have a kidney transplant so that your kidneys work like 7-Elevens, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? Dialysis is good. It's three to four hours, three times a week, depending on how ty what type of dialysis you're using. But I'll, I'll be the first to tell you that kidney transplants are the way to go. I'm going to show you some data which suggests there are still some racial disparities there. And the last thing, which is end-of-life care. I think that, that proper end-of-life care, thinking about things ahead of time when you're in a calm situation, thinking about what you want in terms of advanced directives and what you as a patient want as an individual is really an important thing. And I think there are some disparities there as well. So let me show you those. First, I think that African-American patients, black patients, are actually referred more late. This is a study that was done out of John Hopkins. Some of these slides are courtesy of a researcher there. But what you can see here is that there are racial disparities in terms of when patients are referred to get, the, to get uh, nephrology care. And again, if a nephrologist is there and you're pre-dialysis, there's a lot of stuff I can do to help intervene. If the patient shows up in the emergency room and the kidneys are gone, there's nothing I can do. It's only dialysis and then list you for a transplant. Secondly, in terms of, of transplant utilization, if you look at racial disparities against the utilization of live kidney transplants, and there are two types of kidney transplants. There's a live kidney transplant where your friend, a relative, someone who matches your blood type who's still alive, gives a kidney to you, your kidney function goes back to normal, you no longer need dialysis. There's something called cadaveric liver trans, uh, renal transplant where if you're in a car accident and you no longer need your organs, you can give them to someone who actually needs them. And what we find is, unfortunately, that there are a significant number of racial disparities here, that in terms of pre of transplant that is defined as a transplant before the patient needs dialysis, which is the best type of transplant, that there are racial differences and there are a number of different reasons for that which I think have to do with access to care. 
these are patient issues, physician issues, and system issues, but if you think about it, all of these basically boil down to access to care issues. There's both a knowledge deficit in terms of people not necessarily knowing that they have the disease or what transplant means, but there are also significant process deficits, and all of which I think in a bundled payment system allows resource use to be appropriately spread out in the right direction to address these issues. Lastly, in terms of geographic variations in terms of, of race, I do think that for patients who have end-stage disease, if you actually have an issue in terms of wanting to have an advanced directive, you should plan out, just like you plan out your will, you should probably plan out how you think your medical care should be. It's apparent to me that, again, from an access to care perspective, this, conversations are not happening. There is a racial issue there, and we need to address that. So at the end of the day, how are all these racial issues being addressed? Within DaVita, we have benefited from the bundle. We have been able to use some of the resources of being an integrated healthcare provider that we're afforded in a bundle payment system and been able to add, allocate those to try to address some of these issues. We have issues around improving biochemical parameters, issues around improving infection, issues around improving immunization, issues around improving screening and transplant adequacy. And so all of these come at a significant cost in terms of focusing in on these new clinical innovative processes, but population health management is exactly what we're here for. We're all here. When I left medical school, I was going to serve the patient. I serve the patient now at a different level, but I'm here to tell you today that at the end of the day, a bundled payment system, specifically looking at the example of dialysis, one, helps to address some of the issues that are inherent in the system around racial disparities and access to care, and two, in an adequately funded system, continues to improve care across the board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Krishnan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, after we hear from Dr. Um, Lazarus, we will open it up to question, questions and Hello, very great honor to be with you here this morning. I live in San Diego now, and during the evenings, I've noticed that slight chill that says um, fall is on the way, and since we have no seasons <laughs> in San Diego, it's nice to feel back home again. <laughs> so here's a physician, and he's holding a red pill and a blue pill. And um, this is what medical care so much has been like. Should it be the red pill or should it be the blue pill? And so um, I'm here to give you my take home point, which is African American people have a widely disproportionate share of the burden of both metastatic colorectal cancer and lung cancer. Um, why is that? Well, some of the reasons have been a lack of penetration of preventive me uh, messages. For colorectal cancer, it's been a lack of access, quite frankly, to um, preventive colonoscopy. And I'm here to tell you that I am absolutely determined and have been working extensively um, with Congress to make certain that reimbursement is sufficient, that new tests that are the gateway to new potentially life-saving medications um, are going to be there for the African-American community. That's my take-home message. Um, here's what we're, we're talking about. Um, look at this. Um, antidepressants. Uh, about 40% in terms of not working. Um, arthritis drugs greater than 50%, but cancer drugs, about 75% first go through are not working. That's for everybody, and we need to, to change that. We need to have laboratory diagnostics that are specific, that are personalized, that are targeted, that help doctors get it right the first time for patients. That's what I'm working for. Well, here are the numbers overall in estimated new cases in 2012 for men and women. Um, lung cancer, um, about 117,000 new cases for men, 110,000 for women, about 14% of new cases for both men and women. Colon and rectum, 9%, 9% for men, about 73,000 plus for men, 70,000 plus for women. But here's really what so terribly concerns me on top of all of that. So the incidence rate 
per 100,000, 74.7 for African Americans for lung cancer, whites 64.4, Native American Alaska Natives 44.9. 74.7. Next, look at what's been going on in the African American community. It's the turquoise triangles. Look at this incidence rate per 100,000 for colorectal cancer, and look what the mortality has been. Highest incidence, highest mortality. We have to change that. Well, as I was preparing for today, I um, reviewed the three ethos of the uh, Congressional Black Caucus uh, Foundation Health Brain Trust. And I wanted to talk about ethos three for just a second, if I uh, can be allowed, and just go through it with you. Health and healthcare investments that eliminate health disparities and achieve health equity and justice are good debt. The nation's leading economists agree that good debt is investment debt that creates or improves value. The CBC Health Brain Trust therefore believes firmly that racial and ethnic health disparities will continue to persist until we, as a Congress, view an increased expenditure and efforts to achieve health equity as good debt. By investing more in the health and health care of not only African Americans, but all Americans who have unmet health and health care needs. We're making an investment that it will, in fact, create value by bolstering the health and well being of not only individuals and communities, but the workforce, our defense, and ultimately our nation. And I felt that this was so important to just take the liberty and your time to restate as we face another financial cliff and those who would talk about cutting back even further. And um, it always seems that women, women, infant, children, prenatal, and um, programs that could help bridge um, uh, African American and multicultural community health disparities are always right there in the lens to be cut first. Well, I don't want that to happen because um, we are poised on uh, a new era, a new era of companion diagnostics and targeted cancer care that are making some extraordinary um, inroads. And I'm going to show you a slide in a minute or two that um, absolutely amazed me, as I'm sure it will absolutely amaze you. And, and it really dramatically shows you that um, we're in a new era, a radically new era, and we're poised on it. And I am determined that communities of color will have equal access for the tests that are the gateway for these new life-saving drugs. Yes, it's a high cost of new therapies, about $71,000 per patient for a six-month treatment. But look closely at this. If all colorectal cancer patients were probably, properly identified, $53 million per year. $753 million per year. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm not from a pharma company. I'm a physician, and yes, I do work in molecular diagnostics. Don't get, let them get you lost in the $71,000 figure. Concentrate on properly identifying African American colleagues, friends, family, and concentrate on this number, that by using advanced molecular diagnostics properly in the community on tumors, both lung and colorectal, just in colorectal alone, $753 million of savings. So when in 10 days, the fiscal cliff and communities of color are in the, the target in terms of where they're gonna cut, please keep all of this in mind and say, no, you're wrong. We need to have access for these tests. 
We demand to have access for these new and life-saving drugs. The tests are the gatekeeper and, and positively identify who can um, best, um, how, who will best benefit from these drugs, and they need to be used in concert. This is exactly what I'm talking about. This is an emerging trend, and um, this is the integration of diagnostic tests to drive targeted, personalized healthcare decision making so that it's not just the 50-50 of the red pill and the blue pill anymore. It's information and the power of information that's personalized to a person-specific cancer. These are called companion diagnostics and they are diagnostic tests that can identify patients most suitable for therapy, stratify patient risk, and guide treatment decisions. The FDA is in the process of applying what they call Breakthrough Di Designation Act's regulatory flexibility and speed to companion diagnostics as well as medicines. They're on board, but remember, money makes the world go round. So the FDA is realizing how important this is, how important this is to communities of color. Still, somebody's got to be able to fund the tests. And so in a very um, straightforward manner, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a mutation called KRAS for colon cancer patients. If you test patients, you're able to go right to treating with the appropriate drug for better treatment outcomes, more efficient spending. And if there's no testing, we have to continue with a um, trial and error approach. And you've seen what the outcome is with that. You saw how high the death rate is um, in the African-American community with metastatic colorectal cancer. And that was that slide that I showed you with the um, <coughs> turquoise triangles. There's an ecosystem of quality and compliance. It starts with the manufacturer country so that um, impacted communities can have access to the test. You may not know this, but it's an extraordinarily um, lengthy process um, for those of us who develop these tests. They're not just tests where you do the usual stuff. Can it be reproducible in different labs? Is it, what is the sensitivity of the test? We do lengthy clinical trials, very pharmaceutical-like, um, very expensive, um, but that's why the FDA says that these tests that have had these extensive clinical trials that are approved by the agency are the tests that must be used as companion diagnostics to these new cancer um, these new um, cancer drugs. We're very honored to have been chosen by some of the United States and the world's biggest companies to be their diagnostics partner in the uh, development of these new era of targeted therapies. And this is what I wanted to show you about what it leads to. Look at this. This is a patient who is treated after being tested properly, that they knew that it was the, the gentleman was a candidate for treatment for his advanced lung cancer, February 6, 2002. Both lungs riddled with tumor. Five days later, after being identified as a candidate for these new life-saving tests, five days later, lung fields virtually cleared of tumor lesions. That's why I feel so strongly about this. It's one thing that the African-American community has had to bear the burden of lung cancer and colorectal cancer. Let's not um, compound that by limiting access to the tests that determine the targeted treatments to save lives within the community. And I, I included this slide to show you just how extraordinary it can be when the right patient is determined by the right test for the right therapy. We have very little, I have very little time left, but in the minute or two or three, I want to just tell you what we're all facing together with Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. 
Here it is in a nutshell. From 2012 to 2013, EGFR test, which is the gatekeeper test to determine who has the correct mutations to get those new class of drugs, rate went down 75%. KRAS, which is the determination if people don't have the wrong mutation, went down 13%, and that's the test for colorectal cancer. So current reimbursement rates don't cover laboratory costs to perform the test. As a result, it becomes financially impossible for community labs to administer these companion diagnostic tests. I just want to do one more point on this slide. I want to tell you something that I didn't know. If oncologists even perceive that there's a lack of access to these diagnostic tests, they immediately move on to older therapies. That's a terrible situation because older therapies are really that, um, uh, that, that trial um, that, um, that we, we saw before that doesn't lead to um, effectiveness and much more um, side effects. This is where we are now in terms of CMS. Um, in a week, CMS will give what's called the final rule. It's really not the final rule, although they call it the final rule. It's, um, <clears throat> it's they're giving a formal dollar amount that's up for public comment. There's a tiny little comment period, and then it's locked in. Ladies and gentlemen, once it's locked in, it requires an act of Congress to reopen that dollar amount. It's never happened before that they've reopened the dollar amount. And so I urge you to see my colleague, Jackie Kahn, um, who has our position paper that was um, the Matsui McKeon letter with special thanks to Congresswoman Lee for her support. And this will give you a, a very quick briefing just by reading the letter and so that you can um, come on board to support this effort for proper reimbursement. Let's prevent cancer. This is a responsibility that both policymakers and healthcare providers share. And when that's not possible, let's treat as quickly, safely, and effectively as possible. Companion diagnostics give us the ability to determine which patients will benefit from the newest, most effective, and potentially life-saving cancer treatments. If we can't prevent this on a Monday, let's turn it into this on a Saturday. Let's challenge the future and change it together. Thank you.